So Senator Blumenthal, thank you so much for taking the time of your terribly busy schedule to speak with me today. Thank you for having me. Great to be with you. You need no introduction, so I'm going to get straight into it. I have three questions for you, and my first is, what are you hearing from Connecticut constituents about the needs of teachers, students, and children during social distancing? Well, that really is one of the questions I hear most often because parents are so deeply concerned about their children, and your book provides such a wonderful guide to them in how to, particularly when kids are at home, deal with the challenges and the needs of those students at this very difficult time. And so what I'm hearing from parents is a concern about the present, how to keep their children actively engaged in studying at every age and class level, but also about their future. Will they go back to school this fall? What will they do this summer? And will they lose the kind of active engagement that is so important to learning the interest and the desire to read? And I think what this period has concentrated our parents in thinking is essentially their role in their children's education and also what really makes a good education. And they are deeply concerned about their children's health and safety, obviously. Coronavirus is potentially a deadly disease. It's so insidious, it takes people of all ages, but fortunately, children seem to be less vulnerable to the more serious forms of the disease. So parents are really concerned about the social and educational well-being of their children as never before. And uh, in almost any conversation I have about family, it is about homeschooling, distance learning, online education. And so again, your work is particularly pertinent at this point in our history. I appreciate that. That means a lot coming from you. Thank you so much. I'd like to move on to my second question, which is what role does the federal government play in making sure that students and parents are able to transition from courses in classrooms to courses over a laptop on the kitchen table? Uh, that is a question very much on my mind and my colleagues' mm. minds at this point. And the simple answer is our role has to be greater than it has been. We provide educational aid through federal funding to states, which then distribute it to cities and localities. In Connecticut, for example, and many other states, our local school districts are primarily dependent on property taxes. A lot of those property taxes are just not going to be paid. So federal support is going to mean all the more generally to pay for teachers, classroom materials, uh, school upkeep, maintenance, new building. We need to invest in our schools. But more to the point, in these next months, in light of the persistence of this pandemic and the possibility of a second wave in the fall winter, online learning is going to be especially critical. So the federal government in the last CARES Act, the Congress, has enabled the Secretary of Education to repurpose or reallocate funding under the federal education programs to distance and online learning. The funds that have been allocated can be, in effect, reallocated to that purpose. And my hope is that school districts will invest in the laptops and computers and all of the infrastructure that is necessary. But as important, maybe more so, the federal government should be funding connectivity, broadband connectivity, which is lacking in many areas of our country, not just in rural areas. People often think broadband is lacking primarily in rural areas, but I've talked to parents and teachers and educators in our urban areas here in Connecticut who have said to me as recently as yesterday, the mayor of Waterbury, we need to provide for more connectivity in our urban areas because kids have a homework gap, 
a learning gap. They're simply not connected. The federal government has to support broadband investment and make sure that every child in this country has access to good online learning. And I have urged our leadership and proposed legislation that will provide funds in the next relief package. We did the CARES Act, which was the third relief package, 2.2 trillion. We're gonna be doing another one, I hope in May, and we'll provide more funding there for broadband connectivity, which is important to young people in schools, but also important to reopening our economy. So I have one last question for you because you covered so much there. Do you see any kind of optimism or opportunity, some hope that you can give anybody who will be watching this? I can give a lot of hope to people. Fantastic. Because we've been through a lot in this country, maybe even worse than this pandemic. Uh, civil wars and strife uh, and a depression that was as dislocating and difficult and distressing to many people. I've seen the grief and frankly, the hardship and heartbreak of this disease impact friends, family, loved ones all around the state. I lost a friend, for example, whose children played with mine growing up and uh, he passed away in five days, relatively young guy. This disease is so insidious and so horrific, but we're developing the vaccines and the therapeutics that are necessary to address it, make it less scary as well as less dangerous. And so I'm hopeful that if we continue the physical distancing, mask wearing, washing hands, and all the precautions that, in fact, we will turn the corner. And we must turn the corner on the disease in order to turn the corner on the economy because people are not going back to work, back to school, back to the restaurants until they feel safe and secure. The two go together, healthcare and the economy. And we need to do more testing, which is well within our grasp. I've been urging the Defense Production Act be used mm -hmm. by the president to make more masks and other protective gear, more testing and more contact tracing that will determine who has been in touch with people who may be infected. Of course, testing for antibodies, which will determine who is immune, making the vaccines more available. I'm hopeful that within a year we'll have them. And most important immediately is the treatments and therapeutics. I think we're close to developing better treatments. I think that's maybe one of the most hopeful signs here. So I think we'll return to normal, not like a light switch, as Dr. Fauci says, not suddenly all at once, but gradually. I hope we'll keep in place the precautionary mitigation measures that will prevent a spike in a second wave. I'm hopeful, again, hopeful that we will. So I think uh, we as a nation have come together in a way that is very impressive. People giving to each other, caring for each other, trying to eliminate the social isolation mm -hmm. and the mental health and emotional impacts. Uh, uh, so I, I really am hopeful that we will get through it. And I've seen just enormous generosity on the part of so many people. It's one of the worst occurrences in my lifetime, but it's brought out the best in a lot of people. Well, thank you so much, Senator Blumenthal, for your continued service and leadership. And I'm so sorry for your loss as well. Thank you. Well, a lot of people have suffered the same losses a lot worse than I have. And what is so terrible about the losses is that people are dying alone and then their loved ones can't be with others mm -hmm. who would offer comfort physically. Uh, so I think the emotional and mental health impacts of this virus are gonna be difficult to overcome. And it goes back to what's happening to children as well. What I hear from parents is a concern about the impacts on their children, about their education, about their social and emotional learning, and their 
in effect, their adjustment to society, which again, you describe so well in your book. And um, thank you for your good work and thanks for including me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much.